Okay, so welcome to um, PDE's lecture two. Today we're going to continue um, solving first order differential equations. Still busy with the quasi linear first order differential equation. And so, just a brief reminder of what we looked at the last time is we said if you have the solution to this quasi linear, you can view the solution to this quasi linear first order equation as a surface. In other words, you can have the solution u, x, and y such that if you substitute it in here, this equation is satisfied. But you can also view it as a surface in three-dimensional space where z, the height, is simply the function u, x, and y. Okay, so you have this idea that you can represent the solution to the quasi-linear equation as the surface. And um, the, if you look at the surface, you can basically, the people call the surface the integral surface. And like with any surface, you can then go and look at its geometric properties. It has its, a normal, and we worked out the normal in general. It's just the gradient of a function that describes the surface. In other words, ux, uy, and minus 1. And then any surface has, is also has two tangents. So I've put in two tangents over here. They are you always linearly independent. And what we then did is we went and we looked at the quasi, what the quasi-linear equation actually means. And the way we did it is we said we're going to make a vector, Tc, that is made up of the functions that you know. In other words, x, y, and you always replace u with z. Right? So x, y, and z, x, y, and z, x, y, and z. And we make a vector of these three functions. Okay. And this vector, we're going to call the characteristic direction. So it's basically an arrow in three-dimensional space that points somewhere. And then we said, if we've defined, described it this way, we can rewrite our quasi-linear equation simply as the vector, that's the characteristic vector, dotted in with the normal, equals to zero. Okay, so we show that our quasi-linear equation is basically equivalent to this statement. And so we try to get some geometric feel of what our solution actually is like. Okay, so at each point in the surface, we know the surface or the integral surface, in other words, the surface that comes from the solution of the PDE, has this property that the characteristic direction is normal to the... Um, uh, is, um, the, the characteristic direction is tangent to the normal, or no, at 90 degrees, the normal vector. And therefore, the characteristic direction actually lies within the tangent space of the surface, as you pointed out. Okay. Yes? Yes. I mean, this is what it says. It basically says that the normal, which is this red arrow, is orthogonal to the characteristic direction. And therefore, this characteristic direction lies within the plane of these two blue, um, blue vectors. Okay, so yeah, it's an orthogonality condition. So what we're now going to do is use this feature to actually try and tell us something about the solution surface. What I also did, and I'm not going to repeat, is I said if we, this way of looking at things is very similar to what people do with ODEs, where you are given a vector field and you want to solve the actual curve that has this vector field tangent to it. Okay, so once again, in PDEs, we're getting a geometric view of solving a solution, and this is how we're setting it up. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to give you a number of theorems that characterize the surface, and then later on, towards the end of the lecture, I'll actually show you how these theorems can be used to solve the equations. Okay, so the first idea is characteristic curves. So we're going to define the family of characteristic curves that are tangent to the characteristic direction. So these curves are related to that characteristic vector that we worked out, that's A, B, C, um, from, that we get from our ordinary differential equation. And we, the way we define our characteristic curves is we basically say along a characteristic curves, the relation dx over a, which is the function that appears in the PDE, 
is equals to dy over b, which is a function that appears, also the function that appears in the PDE is equals to dz over c, which is equals to another incremental thing, dt, which is the parameter along our curve. Okay? That's the definition of our characteristic curve. Okay? And I'm going to write it out equivalently. The reason I write it this way is that Fritz John uses it, and a number of other books uses it. I feel more comfortable if I write down ODEs directly. So T is an arbitrary parameter, so the one way, an equivalent way of writing it out, we basically have three equations over here, okay, three equal signs. So what we can do is consider this batch, and then we, or, uh, those two, and we can say equivalently, we can simply write it as a system of equations where you have no explicit T dependence, that looks like this. So if the relationship is simply I have dz dt is equals to c. The next equation is just dy dt is equals to b and dx dt is equals to a. Okay, so these relations are the same. And so what I now have is three ODEs. Um, and these ODEs are determined by the functions that appear in our quasi-linear equation. And just to be completely formal, A, B, and C are assumed to be continuous. Okay. Sometimes you can do it if they're not, but then you have to be very careful. So the, the rest of the theorem is simply assuming A, B, C are continuous one functions, and they're continuous one in a certain region omega. And what we have is, this is just an ordinary differential equation, that the, and then we have, in ordinary differential equations, we have uniqueness theorems that I did in the, or mentioned in the third year. And it basically is through each point in the region we're considering it, there passes exactly one characteristic curve. Okay? And a quick way of getting to that is by contradiction. Suppose you have a point at which the characteristic, there isn't one characteristic curve, that would mean you have two tangent, different tangent vectors there. Okay, but that's not true because you've specified the tangent vector and you only have one. Okay, so that's a quick just recap of the uniqueness theorem. So it basically means at each point there's one tangent vector and the curve leaves along that tangent vector. Okay, so what that means is basically you have a three parameter family of solutions, right? Because whenever you integrate something, you have a constant of integration and um, you basically can call them the actual solutions. In other words, the curves that correspond to um, having tangents that are A, B, and C. And what in actual fact is true, when we have a curve, we don't care how we've laid, we just care about the curve. We don't care where we are on the curve. So we can actually lose one of the parameters. In other words, because we care just about the family of curves, if we change where we are on the curve, it doesn't change the curve. So we actually only have um, that the solution depends on basically um, two parameters. Okay. So those are our characteristic curves. Remember this one. The definition of a characteristic curve is a curve that satisfies this differential equation where we've gotten these functions from our quasi-linear equation. Okay? And... Um, if you think back into the Stoyatzis course, an example of, remember, there's a little catch. Two degrees of freedom chaos is not possible. Three degrees of freedom it is. Okay? But locally, you can always solve your problem. Okay, so here are the, that's the definition of the characteristic equation. And now, what I'm going to say is those, that idea of those characteristic curves is very, very powerful. So here come the first couple of theorems that helps us characterize the solution of the PDE. So we can say if a surface S, um, where is, is, which is defined by Z equals to U, X, and Y, is a union of characteristic curves, okay, then the solution is an integral surface. In other words, if you think of a PDE, you start it on line, you solve those characteristic equations, like for a whole bunch of like hair that goes off that particular line, and you stick them all together, then you build up the surface. 
So, for example, one example over there is if you look behind you, there's like a hyperbola. Um, and it's made where you have two circles above it and those lines. So, so you can actually make that high surface, so the surface from those lines that go up. Okay, so that you can think of those lines in that construction as the characteristic lines and the surface you're making as the integral surface. So let's prove it, okay? And the way we prove it is through any point P of S, okay, there passes a curve gamma because of the uniqueness theorem, okay? And this curve, right, um, the, tangents, um, the tangent to the curve, remember in the, the last part of the first course, I defined what the tangent of a curve is. Um, the tangent of the curve, okay, lies in the tangent plane of S at P, okay, because P is on S and therefore um, the tangent to the curve is actually the tangent of S as well. Um, and then the thing is, since the tangent of the curve at P has one characteristic direction TC, sorry, has the characteristic direction TC, the normal to S at P obeys TC dot N is equal to zero, and therefore S is an integral surface. Okay, so that proves it one way. If I have my character, find all these curves that solve the characteristic equations, I stick them all together, then I've proved that the union of these curves will give me an integral surface, because I've defined an integral surface as a solution that obeys this property. Okay, now the reverse is, conversely you can show that every integral surface S, and this is the harder one, is the union of characteristic curves. So it goes both ways. If I solve the ODEs, I get a characteristic surface. But inversely, it is always possible to get for any integral surface, um, and it's, it's always true that it is then the union of characteristic curves. So it's, it's, it goes both ways. Okay, or equivalently through every point of S. So this is just rewriting the statement in a way that's easier to prove. Through every point of S, there passes a characteristic curve. Um, contained in S. Okay, these things are not obvious. They take thought, take it home, read through it, draw little pictures for yourself that you understand what's actually going on. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is prove the converse. Um, the forward way is easy, right? Union of characteristic curves, all you have to show that TC dot N is zero and you've got the definition of an integral surface. This reverse one is slightly harder, but it's still totally doable. So the proof goes like this. Let the point P, which is a specific point in three space, lie on an integral surface. Okay, so it lies on the integral surface S, which is a solution to the, to the um, PDE. Okay, and let gamma be a characteristic curve through P. Okay, then gamma lies completely on S. Okay, so... The reason that that gets tricky, or why that could be a possible problem, is you could start gamma on the surface, but there's nothing that actually, and you, all you know about gamma is that it obeys that characteristic equation. You haven't yet shown that it actually, if you start on the surface, it's not going to go like off the surface. But in fact, that's not true. It does stay on the surface, and that's what we're now going to prove, um, is we're just simply going to sort of work out the consequences of the thing very, very carefully, and that constitutes the proof. So here, let's simply write out. So let gamma be a parameterized curve, in other words, x of t, y of t, z of t, that solves 1, which is basically that characteristic equation. So x dot is equals to a, y dot is equals to b, and z dot is equals to c. Okay, and now we're going to start this curve on the characteristic surface. So it has an initial condition, x, y, and z at t equals to 0, so that x, y, and z lie on the surface. In other words, they are point P. Okay, so we're starting our curve on our characteristic surface. And what we have to do is we want to quantify whether this curve stays on the surface or whether it 
goes its own way. So to quantify that, we want to quantify the departure of gamma um, from S, and so we simply write down the difference. Let's make this function U, which is simply Z of T, which is defined as lying on your characteristic surface, minus U of X and T and Y and T. Okay, so that's the departure of the curve gamma. So Z of T is associated with a gamma. And U of X and T, Y and T is defined as your characteristic surface. So we define that. And what we now do is we know that U at T0 lies on the characteristic surface since we started the curve on the characteristic surface. So we find that. So what we do next is look at how u changes, and so what we're going to work out is du dt. And so this is where it gets a little bit tricky, just make sure where you know where this next relationship comes from. So du dt is simply dz dt um, minus, and now we've got to use, um, we basically take the full derivative of u with respect to t, so we'd use the, um, the chain rule, it's du dx, evaluated in x and t, times dx dt, minus du dy, evaluated in x dt, times dy dt. Okay, so that's the total change of u, um, du dt. And so now, we know what dx dt, um, du z dt, and dy dt is. Okay, so dz dt, just from the definition of what a characteristic curve is, is c, um, dx dt is a, and dy dt is b. Okay, and so what we have now is this equation. What can we say about this equation? Well, we know u of x and u of y lie on the characteristic surface. We know that Z is associated with a characteristic curve. So that need not lie on the characteristic surface. And so what we're going to do now is, but we know how to express Z in terms of this departure and, the and something that lies on the characteristic surface. So what we're now going to do is replace the Z um, using this departure. So we're going to say Z is simply something that lies on the characteristic surface plus U, which is the departure. Um, X is also this Z, we've replaced Z over there as well and over there as well. So we now want to solve, see what the properties of the solution is. We have the UDT is equals to this guy. Okay. Um, and we know that initially u is 0. Okay. And x and y are fixed by gamma because we've solved the characteristic curve. And so now how the argument is goes, since u satisfy the quasi-linear equation, okay, u, x, and y, satisfies the quasi-linear equation, in other words, u, x, and y is equals to um, c times z plus, um, sorry, c minus u, x times a minus u, y times b. If u equals to zero, okay, then this thing is zero. Okay. And so if u is equals to zero, this thing is zero, du dt is zero, so we actually have a valid solution to the equation. Okay. And, but, um, so u equals to zero, if we put it strictly, is a particular solution. It's one solution to equation three. But because we are dealing with an ODE, we have a uniqueness theorem that says if you find one, it's the unique one. So we know that u is zero is the only solution, and therefore we've basically proven that the curve never departs from the surface. And that's the other way. 
Okay, clever. So we now know, we don't know what the surface is, but we do know properties of the surface. In other words, if we construct the surface from the characteristic lines, then um, the surface um, is an integral surface, and we also know that any surface can be constructed in this way. Okay, even though we still don't know the surface, but we know a lot about its geometric properties, which is very, very nice. And eventually, so it's kind of this result in mathematics that it says something, but it is not yet, from a physicist's perspective, useful. So the next step is going to make it useful, and this is where Cauchy was a brilliant mathematician as well as basically a very practical physicist. Okay, so now we're going to go on. So that type of statement is a general statement about the nature of the solution. Now the Cauchy problem typically looks for specific solutions. So now we're going to solve what we call, the, we're first going to formulate, and then we're going to solve the Cauchy problem. Okay, so the Cauchy problem is as follows. The general solution of the um, quasi-linear equations that we've just looked at is basically the integral surface, z equals to uxy, is a union of characteristic curves. That's a general property. It's an abstract property. And we now desire to make specific solutions. Okay? And to make a specific solution, we're going to be given a set of data. It's, it's completely analogous to the idea of when you integrated just ordinary differential equations, you had a general solution where you added the constant, and if you integrated over a certain set of boundaries, then you had a specific answer. Okay, so this data is basically the information you give about the solution that starts it off. Okay, it's a way of choosing a specific solution from your abstract solution space. Yes? Yeah, it's a boundary condition, effectively. It's exactly a boundary condition. Um, and what the nice way of the way Cauchy formulated it is he, he prescribed the most general way in which you can define the boundary. And you'll see that for specific, later on, for specific differential equations, there are different types of essential data you have to specify. Like for an ODE, you have to, with that's, um, say an ODE that's just first order, you have to give the starting value. For an ODE that's got two derivatives in, like a projectile, you have to give the starting value and the initial velocity. And the same thing is true for PDEs, it's just a generalization of that. Okay, so the data is literally prescribed functions that start off your differential equation and determine the, the specific answer. Okay, so one way of selecting a specific solution or a specific integral surface is to prescribe a curve in XYZ space. Okay, so this is the most active, um, most general way of fixing the data. You have a surface, if you want to say something about the surface, the very minimum you need is a curve on the surface. Okay, and we're going to call this curve the Cauchy curve and we're going to call it gamma. Okay, so we're going to say gamma is contained in the integral surface, it's part of the solution, and we're going to now describe gamma, in other words it's just going to be a parametric curve, so we're going to say there's a parameter s, so that this curve in 3 space is x equals f of s, y equals g of s, and z equals to h of s. Okay, and now what we're going to do is we're going to seek solutions of the quasi-linear equations that um, are such that on this, this curve lies on that surface. Okay, so along the curve, this relationship holds. In other words, z is equals to u of x and y. Okay, and this is how we characterize those solutions is basically going to be our Cauchy problem for quasi-linear equations. So here's the picture again. We've now got more than just our abstract surface with character that's made out of the characteristics. We've got an abstract surface that goes through a specific curve. And so we're going to call this thing our Cauchy curve. And um, we're basically going to say um, 
use describe the surface on that curve and then build this, the actual solution from the information on this curve. And so the thing that I've just, the example that I've just given, like if you start something off and you let it go, the, one of the most common ways of doing it is if we identify Y with time and X with space, okay? Then a way of describing the Cauchy curve is to say at times T equals to zero, we know what the solution is. That's basically what I did with the advection equation. T equals to zero, I know what the solution is, and then there, it determines the rest of the solution. So remember that bump picture I gave you in the first lecture, where you had the bump, that was our initial condition. It could have been any shape, it could have been a hand. Um, if you had, the, say, the initial shape, and then what the advection equation did is it just moved it like that. So that initial um, uh, data is on this Cauchy curve. Okay, so one example of a Cauchy curve is an initial condition. It is not the only problem. When we do GR, we did the full general thing. Um, but the one you encounter the most and you'll encounter in most physical problems is you know what the system is initially. Like if you solve the heat equation, you know what the heat distribution is. You want to know what it's going to be later in time. Okay, so one way of specifying the Cauchy curve is then basically to say at x equals to zero, which is basically space, oh, at y equals to zero, because we've identified y with time, at y equals to zero, that's our initial thing, x is just the parameter along the curve, and z is just h of s. Okay. Um, and the reason I gave you the first exec problem is because we're going to get back to it and prove to you where that idea of characteristics actually came from. It was just an introduction. I'm going to put it into this framework towards the end of this lecture. Okay, so that's the Cauchy curve. What we now want is we want to seek solutions with u, x, 0 is equals to h of x. Okay, so we're basically specifying our initial condition for this particular, and this this problem where they have, where they actually say time equals y, at time t equals to zero, um, x, you specify the initial thing is known as the initial value problem. Okay? It is a subset of the most general possible Cauchy problem you can have. Okay? So this is exactly what we did for the advection equation, and we call this the initial value problem. So it's just one example of the Cauchy problem. The most general Cauchy problem is you to specify any curve in X, Y, and Z. You give the information on that curve, and then you build the solution off of that. And so now the question is, when can we do this? Are there curves we can specify um, that work? Can we specify any curve? Um, and when is it possible? And the answer is, you cannot specify any curves. It only works in particular place, uh, in, with, under particular conditions which we're now going to derive. Okay, so there's our Cauchy problem again. There's our um, uh, integral surface. Here's our Cauchy curve. Here's a point on the Cauchy curve that we used for the previous theorem. The integral surface, remember, has z equals to u of x and y, which is a solution to your PDE. Your Cauchy curve is your initial data. That's given to you. So your PDE, this guy is given to you. That guy is given to you. This idea of an integral surface we've just proven exists. Okay, so here's our Cauchy curve. And so I said we can build the Cauchy curve by at each point we solve the characteristic equation. Okay, so at this point, we solve the characteristic equation. It makes a curve that we've proven lies on the surface. At this point over here, the idea is we solve the characteristic equation with a different initial condition on the curve. It makes another part of the surface. And so these are our characteristic lines sitting over there and making up the surface. And now we want to know when is it possible to actually do this. So let's have a look. So what we're going to do is, once again, we're going to assume all the functions are C1 continuous near a particular point P0. Okay? And these assumptions are useful because we're going to actually work out where the things fail um, in a while. 
Um, so it's useful to always know what assumptions you've made and when things start going wrong, you go back to examining your assumptions. So we assume our functions are C0. We start here at a particular point P0. Okay, we know P0 is equals to that point as well as it lies on the Cauchy curve. So F of S0 is X0, G of S0 is Y0, and H of S0 is y, uh, Z0. Okay, the integral surface consists of the um, characteristic curves gamma S. So here we've shot them all off. So they're the blue curves. Um, they all pass through gamma. And so for S near S0, so remember S0 is over there. So for S near S0, in other words, a little region around P, um, we can show that the parameterized surface gamma is simply x equals to x of s and t, y equals to y of s and t, and z equals to z of s and t. So how does that work? Remember, if you move along this curve, the Cauchy curve, you change s, okay, because that's the way we've parameterized it. If you move along this light colored curve, you're changing t because we solved our characteristic equation. So at times t equals to zero, you start here, you increase it, and you shoot out your characteristic curve. So for a little patch around p0, you can say your surface depends on where you started shooting off your characteristic curve and how far along the characteristic curve it's actually gone. Okay, so this is how we then make the surface. And what we're going to do now is at times t equals to zero, we're simply going to have the surface reduced to gamma because at t equals to zero, we've simply pulled back all our characteristic curves to where we actually shot them off from. Okay, so for all s and t, we, can, we know that x obeys the characteristic equation, so dx dt is just a of x, y, and z. dy dt is just b, and dz dt is just c. Okay, and these guys obey the initial conditions that you have shot them off from the characteristic curve, so I'm just rewriting physically what I've just explained. So at t equals to zero, you have x of s, any way along the curve is simply f of s, y of s is simply g of s, and z of s is simply h of s. Okay, so here comes the key thing. What we want to do is we want to go and we want to express x and y in terms of s and t, right? So you can imagine x and y is the grid at the bottom, but you could have shot this characteristic curve of skew, the surface can be turned, and you want to know how you go from x and y to s and t. And the way you do that is we simply have a relationship between x and y and s and t, and that's given... Where's my thing gone? That's given over here. Okay, so express x and y x and y in terms of s and t, we are given this transformation. Okay, we don't know what it is explicitly, but we do know that it exists. And so to do that, we're going to say, let s be a function of x and y, and t be a function of x and y. And the question is, then u, which is a function of x and y, is simply z evaluated at s that we've gotten from this relationship and t. It looks like I'm restating the obvious, right? But the key thing comes this, is it must be possible to do this. And those are the conditions I work out. And whenever it's possible to do this, you're fine. When it's not possible to do this, you cannot make the surface this way. So we basically have now another representation of the surface sigma, okay, done in this way.
And what we want to do is we're going to focus just in this local area where we started deriving it. And what we're going to say is, what are the conditions that the solution actually exists locally? Okay. What are the conditions that it is possible that we've constructed the thing using our characteristic curves, and then we can go back and express um, X and Y in terms of S and T and actually find what the answer, what the actual surface is. And to write those conditions down is to solve the Cauchy problem. Okay. So, and we're now going to work that out, and it turns out to be a very nice answer. Okay. Have you ever played with taking Cartesian coordinates to polar coordinates? Okay. And then, what did you work out when you worked with the transformation? There's something that you always work out with the transformation when you want to do integrals that way. Do you remember a thing called the Jacobian? Oh, yeah. Ooh, he comes back to haunt you. Um, it's key to this thing, right? Whenever you work with transformations between variables, you always work out the Jacobian, which is the determinant of the first derivative matrix. And the transformation is well defined if the Jacobian is not zero, and therefore you can invert the um, you can invert the transformation. And so. The conditions we're going to work out on the next slide are closely related to the Jacobian or the transformation. And to see how it actually arises practically is what we're going to do next. Okay, so here's our very pretty picture that took me hours to draw. Here is x0 and y0. Okay, and remember from the previous slide, it's simply x of s0 at t equals to 0 and y of s0 at t equals to 0. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use the implicit function theorem um, in a while, and we're going to say the solutions S equals to S of X and Y and T equals to T of X and Y, um, of which we've basically inverted this transformation that we started here with X and Y. In other words, this inverse transformation um, is of class, if those two are of class C1 in the neighborhood of X0, then, um, uh, and they obey this, that S0 is simply this, it's just restating that S0 marks this point, okay, and T is where you start shooting off the curve, then that inverse can be found provided the Jacobian of the transformation between S and um S and T and X and Y is not zero. Okay, so remember the Jacobian is simply J equals to dx dS um, uh, dx dT um, dy dS dy dT. So you're basically taking this thing, this transformation over here, working out what X, the derivative of X is with respect to S the derivative of x with respect to t, and the same for y, okay? And we only care about it at this point, so we put s equals to s0 and um, t equals to 0. Okay, if this thing doesn't vanish, we're fine. You've done a legal thing, okay? You get your curve, you shoot off the characteristics, you build your surface that way. But, important, you always have to check that. Okay, great you say, but what am I checking now, right? I don't know what X and Y is, I don't know what S and T is, how on earth am I going to check it? And so the next part is to rewrite this in the stuff you know. What do you know, right? You know what the curve is, okay, that you're given as the initial data. You also know what A, B, and C are, those are known functions. And they're known functions in X, Y, and Z, and because you know X, Y, and Z on the curve, you can work them out. So we now want to go about and write this condition that the solution exists locally, and that the transformation exists, in terms of these known guys. 
So let's do that. Let's look and examine every single one of these guys and rewrite them in terms of the things we know. So the first one is easy. X of S at 0 is simply the coordinate on the curve. So that's simply F of S. Okay. So if we work out the derivative, we can work out the derivative with respect to S because we know it as a function of S. So XS at S0 is simply the derivative of F, which we are given a no at S0. Also, we know what X, this derivative with respect to T is, because we know X is a solution of the characteristic equation, and therefore we know that it is characterized by the fact that its derivative with respect to T is just A. So that makes things simpler now. So we've already got x of s is simply f prime of s0, x of t is a, and we can do the same thing for y by exactly the same arguments, right? Simply y s is simply g prime at s0, because we know y of s at 0 is simply g of s, and therefore its derivative is simply g prime. And we know that y t is equals to b by version of our characteristic equations. And so we have it over there. So that's a much nicer thing to now go about checking, because you can check it. Okay, and so the condition that the solution exists um, is simply that this thing is not zero. Okay, so that's something. If ever you're given a characteristic curve, and you are given the quasi-linear equation, always check this thing, okay, that you can do. Um, but what we're going to do now is, what does that mean? Right. So, this condition guarantees that you can get a local um, parametric surface, so you can build it up with the characteristics, and it'll go through your curve, um, and we'll get to doing that in practice later on. But what does it mean if it fails? Okay. So this is important condition. It guarantees the parametric surface and the local representation that. But the next slide is to work out what actually it means. Okay. So this is just what we've said on the previous slide. It's the surface parametric construction from unification through curves. Um, and it can have a local representative representation that's guaranteed if this condition holds along your Cauchy curve, where these primes are derivatives with respect to S. Okay, so that ensures the uniqueness of, um, it basically ensures uniqueness, and basically any integral surface through gamma contains these characteristic curves. So that's just a summary of everything we've done. Um, so what we want to do now is basically um, look at why this condition is essential. Okay. And if we look at this condition, suppose it is zero. Okay, so if this condition fails and it's zero, we can just rewrite this thing, assuming that if g prime is not zero, we divide by it. And um, we can rewrite it as f prime over g prime equals to a over b. Okay? And we also know that h prime, the hds over here, is equals to basically the fds ux plus the gds ui. Why do we know that? Yeah, very nice. Very nice. Okay, so Z is simply equals to H of S along the curve. So if you want to take the complete derivative of Z with respect to S, on the, right, on the left hand side you have H prime S. And then if you apply the chain rule over here, you simply have du dx times dx ds, which is f prime, 
plus du dy, which is um, that, times dy ds, which is g prime. Okay, a very nice insight. Okay, so we know this is true. We also know that the quasi-linear equation holds because it's an integral surface. And so what that means is um, if we remove, if we can solve, we can basically eliminate from these equations, we can eliminate ux simply by dividing by this equation by f prime and this equation by a, okay, and we can eliminate, and so we can get rid of ux that way, we can get rid of uy that way, and these three equations together implies that h prime over g prime is equal to c of b. Okay, another way of getting it is simply to say, okay, what happens if we replace f prime over here with um, a over b times g prime, okay, and then divide right through by g, then you get the same condition. Okay, so these three things together apply that h prime over g prime is c over b. It also applies that h prime over f prime is equals to c over a. And what that means is that um, gamma is locally characteristic at s. Okay, so that then is the geometric rule. You're not allowed to choose this Cauchy curve to be a characteristic direction because then you can't build the surface. Because if you choose this thing to be a characteristic direction, all you're going to do is get one line and you're going to learn nothing more about the surface. So the condition that you build your surface is that this curve must not be characteristic. In other words, along the curve, you must always be able to shoot off these characteristic directions. So it's a very, it's almost an obvious statement after the fact, but now it's a statement you can actually check. Okay. So you cannot choose your Cauchy curve to be characteristic at any point. Okay. If you do that, you have no solution um, to the problem, or rather, you simply have, if the whole curve is characteristic, then you simply have one curve on your surface and you've learned nothing else, but you cannot build the whole surface. Okay, so um, if the curve is characteristic, then there are infinitely many solutions because you can then build the, um, you could basically choose any other characteristics and add it to this one and still build the surface. But you are not, um, you're not saying very much about the surface because you've only got one curve on it. Okay. And the solution is unconstrained. And if that's the case, then you're going to have to specify another curve that's not characteristic. Okay. So if this thing fails, the condition fails at one point, you check whether your curve is characteristic. If it's not characteristic, you say you've just got inconsistent data and you're done. If it is characteristic, then you say you've just got one characteristic curve, but you haven't specified the surface. Therefore, you actually need more data to specify the specific particular surface. Okay. So, that's the heavy equations. Let's look at an example to make it real. Let's go back to what we did with the advection equation and actually apply the stuff that we've learned and start checking and see how we actually go about solving equations as a result. Okay. Right. Now, examples. And once you've been through examples, go back and see, make sure you understand the actual theory behind it. So let's start, we've been looking at quasi-linear PDEs. Let's make it one step simpler. Let's look at linear PDEs. So I'm going to make it simpler one step, then I'm going to make it simpler still further to the advection equation. So linear PDEs simply have these functions A, B, and C not dependent on U. Sorry, A and B not dependent on U, but C can be linear in U. So we, instead of having that general situation where we had A is a function of X, Y, and U, we now have A as a function only of 
x and y times ux plus b, a function only of x and y times ui. And then this, what used to be c, we've now split into something that's a function only of x and y multiplied by u, so that it's linear, plus d of x and y. Okay, so now if we have this, our character equations decouple. In other words, we have the x dt equals to a function a, x and y, and dy dt equals to a function b, x and y. And because there's no z in here, we can solve these two equations and then get the equation for z later on. So it's a simpler problem. Instead of having three PDEs, three ODEs where we completely get chaos, we know we only have two. In other words, we always have well-behaved solutions. Okay, so you can solve it this way, or you can do one of these tricks, and you can try and see if you can find solutions, if it's easier to find solutions where you have dy dx equals to b over a. And this typically is easier if there's a, 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 a common factor. There's a, in the first year, you did a whole way, a bunch of ways of solving these equations, or second year. Um, so you can either view it as this thing, draw the phase diagram, try and get the solution that way, or you can simply get rid of t and try and solve that equation with various techniques that you've already learned. Okay, so this thing determines a curve in the xy plane, like you drew a lot of those in my third year class. And these curves we're going to call the characteristic projections. And the reason we call the characteristic projections is remember your characteristic curve was in three space, so x, y, and z. This is only in two space, and what it is is if the characteristic curve went up like that, it's simply the projection onto the xy plane. Okay, the, f um, the full characteristic curve, we can then compute once we've solved those equations, okay, and you know the projection, and um, you can compute it simply from this dz dt equals to c of x and y of t, which you now know from the solution, plus d of dx and dy, of x, y and t. Okay, so the linear PDE is easier than the quasi-linear PDE. Okay, now I just gave that step, an intermediate step between the advection equation because um, it actually, there's some equations that have this property that are easier to solve. So you know in general if you only have A of X and Y, B of X and Y, and C of X and Y times U plus. If you have this form then you can pull these tricks immediately. Okay, so now let's go back to that very first problem we solved, namely the advection equation. Okay, so here we have the advection equation. I've just replaced t with y. So we have c, which is a constant times ux plus um, ui equals to zero. And instead of doing the full general Cauchy curve, I'm going to make the initial value, make the initial value version. So we have at t at y equals to zero, we are given what the function looks like. And so if we now do that, what we're going to do is, and the way you, I find it easiest to solve these things, is I always write down my Cauchy curve, okay? And the Cauchy curve, remember, is a parameterized curve. It has a specific form. So the Cauchy curve... I want the parameter, I know the Cauchy curve is described by y equals to zero, because it's an initial value problem. X, I'm given this thing, the initial condition, so I can simply say x is equal to my parameter s, and z is equals to this function h of x or h of s, because I want the curve to be parameterized with s. Okay, so that's the curve. And now, once I have the curve, I write down the characteristic differential equations, and I have dx dt is equals to c, and it's a constant, which makes it easy to solve. dy dt is equals to a, uh, um, b, which is just 1. Okay. And dz dt is equals to this stuff over here, but they are both zero because there's no nothing in front of u and no constant term. 
So that's just zero. So I've written down my characteristic curve, which is the initial conditions. I've written down the characteristic differential equations. And now I'm going to solve them. Okay. So these are nice differential equations to solve. So I have the XTT is equals to C. So X is simply CT plus a different constant. Okay. But I know when T is equals to zero, X must be equals to S. So that constant is S. Okay. So here we have it. X. You integrate this equation to get X. Be careful. Make sure you integrate them properly. It's a full ODE. So this is an easy one because X is constant. If X is not constant, you must actually solve the thing systematically. It's not always easy. Um, so the XT is equal to C. So the full solution is CT plus a constant. And then we go to the Cauchy curve and we see at T equals to zero, X has got to be equals to S. So there is the solution. And we do the same thing, dy dt is equals to 1, so y is equals to 1 plus a constant. When t is 0, y is 0, so we just have y is equals to t. And we have z, dz dt is equals to 0, so z is just um, a constant, Okay, and that constant, when t is equal to 0, we know that z is equal to h of s. So z is simply equal to h of s. Okay, and so this is our integral surface. Okay, it's the parametric solution of our integral surface. And what we want to do now is go back and write the answer in terms of x and y. How are we going to do that? exactly like we proved the theorem okay we're going to start with these two equations where x equals to a function x of s and t and y equals to a function y of s and t and here are those functions we are going to invert those functions to get s and t as a function of x and y and then we're going to put it in there okay so eliminate s and t Right, T is easy to eliminate because we know Y is equals to T. And then we put Y equals to T in here and we get that S is equals to X minus CY. Okay, so here we have T equals to Y. We put that into the top one and then we solve for S. We get that S is equals to X minus CY. So this is that inverse transformation I was talking about in the previous slide, just written out specifically. And then what we have, we put this into the solution, and there we have z equals to x minus cy, which is exactly the solution I derived for the advection equation earlier. And now you have the technique to do it for absolutely any linear PDE. Okay. In fact, you have more than that. You have the technique to do it for um, any quasi-linear PDE. And that we're going to do next. So the advection equation, we remember it was just a solution. And all that thing tells you, its hump moves along the characteristic curves. Now let's do a little harder problem that we couldn't do just by guessing the answer like we did with the advection equation. So let's, and this is the last topic for the day, let's look, and I'm just going to start it, let's look at Berger's equation. So Berger's equation is very similar to the advection equation, except that over here, our C is not constant. Okay, so all I've done is I've taken the advection equation and I replaced C with U. Okay, and I'm still going to have the initial value problem. I'm going to give you u of x and 0 um, specifically. So our Cauchy curve is still y equals to 0, x equals to s, and z equals to h of s. And this equation was studied a lot. It's a very simple nonlinear equation that people learned a lot about. In fact, 
when people started studying shocks. It's one of the simplest equations that has shocks. And the nice thing is you can actually get that out of this method, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. So this equation was studied by Henry Bateman. So the story of this dude is he was a Caltech professor, and so if you've lived there for a bit, you get all the, all the dirt. And apparently this guy was totally addicted to solving differential equations. In fact, he had a whole bunch of stuff he didn't publish. He would just get a problem, solve it, and then he would, didn't want to take the trouble to publish it. He would put it in his desk drawer. Um, and so the story is, once he died, he had a whole bunch of people that knew he had this habit, that he'd solved a lot of problems other people didn't know. Uh, he's a whole bunch of people, like his postdocs and graduate students, then went into his office and collected, they had, they called it the Bateman Project. They collected all his like little equations that he'd solved privately and just stashed them away. And they wrote a whole bunch of volumes on it. He was an amazing guy on the actual equations that he'd solved. So anyway, one of the equations that he liked was this um, thing because it illustrates so many things about the solution of PDEs. Okay, another guy that solved it later on more, I think with application to fluid dynamics, um, and he most probably used all the Bateman, the Bateman project library that the, the graduate students went and collected all these little hidden secrets. I mean, you learn things about people after they did. <laughs> they, they, they learned all these days. He was still, still teaching integration and mathematics well after he'd passed on in fundamentally new stuff because the people actually went and see what he'd known. Okay, so this PDE occurs in fluid mechanics. It occurs in nonlinear acoustics. It occurs in gas dynamics. Um, it occurs in traffic flow. Simple PDE, but the properties that characterize it are profound. So it's a quasi-linear equation. So, and the reason why it's quasi-linear and not linear is because you have u over here multiplying u x. And let us go. If you just so that you have some intuition of what you're calculating. Let's assume that U is a velocity field, like right? it's the velocity of the particles moving in a wave, say, something like that. Okay, so it's a velocity field on an x-axis, and this changes with time, and once again you can identify Y with time. I've just kept X and Y because it's easier. Um, and what it demonstrates is conservation equations, which we're going to get back to in a while. It develops shocks, um, and it can also be expressed as this thing. Okay, so I'm just giving you all the properties so that when you see a similar equation, you at least know what the property is. And all we're going to do to this equation for today is simply try and apply the stuff we've learned about the Cauchy problem um, to actually try and solve it. So, and then we're going to go on with it um, tomorrow, uh, on Tuesday as well. So this is the um, Burgers equation. To check that these two are the same, just this is half u squared's derivative. If you take the derivative of the x, it's just the, uh, the chain rule. So that is half times 2 u u x. That's exactly the same thing. This form is just easier because you can derive other things from it. Okay, so now we're going to go and we're going to work out the parametric solution for it. And you'll see why this technique of using the characteristics is so powerful, because you could get solution, you could guess the solution for the advection equation, okay, if you played with it long enough. It would be extremely difficult to guess the solution for the inviscid burgess equation, but the formulism I've given to you actually treats them as exactly the same. Okay, which is what's nice, is you have a very powerful technique that can solve quite difficult equations, and it's the same technique. Okay, so your initial velocity distribution, which is on the Cauchy curve, once again, is just this thing. And I like to keep the thing rigid, like I like to have my parameter on the Cauchy curve called s. So I have x equals to s, y equals to zero, because y over there is 0, that's how I specified the initial condition, and um, z equals to h of s. Okay, I write down my characteristic differential equations, 
So I have the XTT equals to, and be careful here, it must be Z. Because remember the way I've prescribed my characteristic equations, it's a characteristic equation in X, Y, and Z space. Okay, so I have the XTT equals to the coefficient of UX, which is U, but I replace it with Z because it's the characteristic surface or the characteristic equations. Dy dt is the coefficient of, is basically b, so that's 1. And dz dt is equal to 0. Okay, so here you must be careful. You can't do what I did in the previous example, just solve all these equations directly. Z depends on time. So you must first find z before you can actually even attempt to solve this dx dt. Okay. So you go, when you solve these equations, you go to the easy ones. And for the examples, I tend to always give you one, at least one that's easy. You solve that first, then you substitute it back into finding, solving this equation. So let's start here. dy dt is equal to 1. So you integrate it. So y is equal to t plus a constant. When t is 0, you know that y is 0. So we know that y is simply equals to t. Then you go to this next one, dz dt is equal to 0, so z is just the constant, but it's dependent on s. When t is 0, that constant is simply h of s, so there we have it. So now we know what z is, okay, and then you substitute what z is back in here, and then you have dx dt equals to a constant with respect to t, which is just h of s. So our solution is then h of s times t plus a constant, okay, and that constant must then be um, 0. So here I said x is equals to s plus h of s or z, these two are the same thing, times t. Are you with me here? Okay, great. So now I have this parametric representation of the solution. And what I want to do to get back into a solution in terms of x and y is I want to eliminate s and t. Okay. And I want to eliminate s and t because I want an explicit answer, which most people usually desire. Sometimes it's not possible to get easily, but for this one it is. Okay, and the way I do it is that once again I simply have that y is equals to t, that's fine. I substitute um, y equals to t in there, so I have x is equals to s plus um, zy, okay, and z, remember, is basically... Um, a function of s. Okay, so what I can do is over here I can use this equation and I can say fine s is equals to x minus zt right and therefore and I know that z is equals to u so I can then say fine u is equals to h of s and s is equal to x minus um, zt, so minus ui. So I get this expression. Okay. But it's not pretty. Okay. It's a valid solution, and you can learn a lot from it. But it's not quite as pretty. Remember when I solved that vexing equation, there was a constant over here. Okay, so I could find it immediately. Here I can't. I have u equals to some function h, which people give me. Um, and then the argument of that function depends on x and y, but it also depends on u. So that's actually quite a difficult equation to draw. Okay, but it is an answer. Okay, so what do we do? Or what do I do? To try and understand what the surface that's given by this implicit expression actually does, I go back to my parametric solution and I actually plot a picture of what the surface is. 
for a specific HLS. Okay. Um, so this is the formal implicit solution. U as a function of X and Y obeys this thing. It's quite hard to plot even if you're given H. Okay. And what we're going to do now is actually plot this thing and that's where I'm going to leave you guys. So the first thing I do, if I want to plot it, I work out the characteristic projection, namely the lines project the characteristic lines projected onto the xy plane. So you can think of making your surface out of like a wire mesh of these lines, and you just take a light above and you shine down. Okay, so and that characteristic projection I just call CS. Okay, and to understand those lines, I simply look at these two equations. Okay, so I have x is equals to s plus hs of y. Okay, where did I get this from? Over here, because I know what z is. Okay, so that's what x is, and it's a function of y, and for every single s, I simply have a different line. So this is effectively a line. It's a characteristic projection. For every single S, the line changes. The slope of the line changes dependent on what function I've been told. Okay, and I haven't yet told you what the function is. But whatever I'm telling you, it's going to determine the slope of the line. So my characteristic projection is a whole bunch of lines, but with different slopes. Okay. And on those, along those lines, you know that the solution remains the same. Okay, that's what these equations actually tell us. So that actually lets us draw the solution. And let's see what it is. Um, and then next week we'll all, yeah, next week we'll go further. Here is, suppose you are given the initial velocity, which is exactly the initial velocity I gave you with the advection equation. Okay, it's just the hump function. What I now do is I work out this characteristic projection, which I've calculated simply to be x equals to um, s plus hs of y, so depending on where I start. So it's a bunch of lines. And what I get there is that. Okay, so what does that mean? If, remember here, if y is 0, Okay, x is simply s, right? So the point at which you start tells you what the value of s is. Okay, and then for a particular value of s, you go up this curve, you work out what hs is, and that gives you the slope of the line. So what happens is you have this line going, okay, dependent on that slope, and then as h of s increases, this this thing increases and then the lines start falling over okay sorry it's not the slope it's one over the slope so as h s increases the slope actually decreases and your lines fall over here is y and here is x okay so these are the lines that obey this thing and so what we know of this surface is that it is constant, the actual solution is constant along these lines. So this value h of s here remains the same along this line. Here where h of s was big, it, had a, it sort of falls over faster, but it's going to remain the same over there. So can you now begin to see what the surface is actually going to look like? Even though you can't find the explicit solution, you can still construct the surface because you simply keep the height constant along these lines. And i am just leave this for a while. We'll do this tomorrow. Um, this is what the surface looks like. Okay. Here's your initial condition. Okay. And all I've done is I've taken this characteristic projection line and I have lifted it up to its Z height. And so along here, that height remains constant. Along here, that height remains constant. This height remains constant. And you can see it sort of flattens out. And then over here, the height is remaining constant along the line. 
but the shape of the surface is actually changing. Okay, and you can sort of see is something going to happen. You started with an initial bump, and the, the top part of the bump is going to travel faster than the lower part of the bump. And so the bump is actually like going to break over like a wave break. And this is why Bateman found it fascinating, because it's such a simple example to actually describe why waves start falling over. Okay, it's simply the fact that the velocity of the wave at the top runs faster than the velocity of the wave at the bottom. So, wasn't this, uh, wasn't Bateman a lot of projects, um, I think they use a slew and then, I'm not sure, I'll, I'll look into it, but I'm not sure how he actually saw it. He saw it Physically, for example, you going to solve the training. No, I think uh, that's, that's um, the one that saw it physically was the solitons, mm -hmm. Russell. And he didn't actually solve the equations, he did the, did the experiment. Okay. Um, and that was um, Bateman's equations is a part of what eventually came to be the KDV equations. Later, right at the end of the course, we're going to do the KDV equation, which is basically Berger's equation plus an extra part. Okay, And those equations don't break over, but these equations do. So um, Berger's equations actually built the, and the initial understanding of how waves break. And then what happened with... Um, the solitons, the KDV equation, they added an extra bit to find a way that stops that breaking and then the thing just carries on. Um, so close but not, 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 not entirely accurate. Um, what this thing is a very nice representation of is actually the formalism we've just done. So go through it carefully. Try and draw these pictures on your own. Uh, you know, either by hand, we actually draw the characteristic curves and then just see how they remain constant. You can even like make yourself a little frame with the initial condition and stick like um, top sticks or something in there and then tilt them on the height and then you'll see what the surface looks like. Um, but it's a very nice illust non-trivial illustration of the power of this method where you can actually, even though you can't write down the explicit solution, you still can by hand plot the solution because you know how to construct the surface from the characteristics. And then tomorrow we'll start looking at more of the prop. Oh no, sorry, next week we'll start looking at more of the properties.